Aloha. Welcome to this show, The State of the State of Hawaii. I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. Our show title today is The Question Has COVID 19 Killed uh, Hawaii's Equilibrium? Now, this question is based on an article written by author and contributing editor Don Wallace for Honolulu Magazine in February. In the article, Don examines COVID's effect on the state's economy, including the social and cultural and local supports that made Hawaii work from its lonely spot in the middle of the Pacific, even though it came at a high price. His article discusses what happens now by asking in its title, which we will have a URL up for, uh, so you can get to it if you'd like to read more. And the title of the article is, Will the Higher Cost of Paradise End or End Up Ruining Hawaii? So we have done here, Don uh, Wallace is here to discuss uh, some of these ideas and issues uh, which are very pertinent to, the, to, to and are the challenge uh, for where Hawaii is now. Uh, in its current uh, emergence or post-pandemic, hopefully post-pandemic circumstances, and where it's gonna it's going. So, Don, welcome, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii and this well, show. Well, thank you very much, Stephanie. Thank you for having me, and Thanks. always thank thank you, Think Tech, which is an invaluable uh, aid to journalists everywhere. Um, I've tapped into many programs over many years. Oh, that's wonderful praise. It's good to hear of your viewership and your uh, appreciation of citizen journalism, <laughs> which is quite the adventure. So, so Don, let's get started on uh, some of the implications of your article uh, and the meaning of it. And with explaining what I grabbed from it, which was this issue of what, what was and maybe is and maybe will be or not uh, Hawaii's Equilibrium. Um, what what is the meaning of uh, that that phrase as you used it in the article? The uh, the Hawaii Hawaii's equilibrium. You know, it was something that came to me as I had been interviewing uh, the state economist Eugene Tian, um, economist Paul Brubaker of TZ Economics. These are people I've talked to before and over the years, and, and talking to Mike McCartney over at. Um, you know, DBED. And, you know, we're talking about so much data and, and the the problem of inflation. And remember, I was interviewing these people in, in December for a February story. Here we are, August, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we thought in December that we were writing a story that would be ending about April. You know, inflation would be back. But it still came to me from having come, like everyone, through the pandemic that we lost so much of our sense of Hawaii and during the pandemic, and that we lost this as the inflation began to hit. And then in 2021, the crazy home prices began to spike and the rents began to spike. We, and the food prices and everything else, we, we lost what used to be a kind of very local, lucky you live Hawaii kind of attitude. And one example was, um, you know, you could you could say, well, house prices are going up. Hey, isn't that great? Because I live in a house, and one day it's going to be you know worth more. Um, so, but if you were buying a house, it was like, oh, you know, house prices are going up. Well, on the other hand, my rent's still cheap, and I can go to the beach. I can go to uh, you know Rainbow Drive-in. I can get a plate lunch. It's not too expensive. Um, I could pick a mango off a tree. My neighbor just gave me some lychee. You know, life in Hawaii really has its compensations. Hey, sure, we pay extra for gas, but look at what we got. You know, we don't have heating oil like they do in, in the East Coast and the Midwest. And that was equilibrium where you also have a sense of faith and trust that the, uh, the status quo is always going to have a place for you. And you're always going to kind of have a nice may not be a standard of living, but it, but it's a, a way of being that where you feel good. And I think a lot of us have lost that. 
um, loving feeling, so to speak, in the last couple of years. Plus that loving feeling. Well, I thought it was interesting um, because uh, uh, to, to note that Hawaii is expensive for all of us and many, many people struggle for the privilege of that mango and the lychee trees and get into the beach every day if they can. But there was a history that you brought out in that article that was most informative about how uh, the history of Hawaii's economy has, has led into having um, this state suppressed wages because we have we have suppressed wages compared to the mainland. And until I saw that in your article, I hadn't really understood what was the history. And I know I'm sure it's it's complicated, but you pointed out some of uh, some of that background that has allowed Hawaii to move in that direction of lower income, even though it's more expensive to live here. And why is it that the the, the residents are okay with that? How and I saw that as part of the equilibrium that had been established. These trade does that does that make any right. sense to you? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Basically what you're referring to is the kind of like the thing that um we often don't acknowledge, which is that this state, which was existing in an agricultural agricultural state, uh, basically under the Native Hawaiians, changed into the world's first experiment in mass monoculture. World's first. There's a great book called Sovereign Sugar that everyone should read. Um, we were where everything was kind of, we're going to convert entire islands over to sugarcane. To do that, we needed a subservient labor force. Everyone knows the story of bringing in, uh, you know, draft after draft of contract workers. Uh, the Native Hawaiians didn't work out because they, they they viewed it as their land. Why should they have to work to live here? So then we bring in, uh, you know, Japanese, Chinese, Koreans, um, and that deal depended on you know less than a dollar a day wages and a company store. And so then we created a sort of social mythology of nostalgia for the plantation. Life was good then. Um, everyone took care of each other. When in truth, that kind of disguises the fact that really up until socialized medicine came in and in the 40s, 1940s and 50s, plantation life was extremely hard and life expectancies were low. You know, so we have populations that tend to live really long like the Japanese American, but overall our population um, longevity was not good. And so then we convert around 1959 into a mass tourism boom. There might have been a moment there when people in the state said, you know, we should start paying a really good wage and have um, everyone rise with this uh, boat that were floating with jumbo jets flying in. And um, but it didn't happen. Instead, there was kind of this, okay, we're going to keep everyone down at a low level, about 60 to 70% of the population. Everyone's going to have this low job, which means they're also going to be in public education. We're going to underfund public education and send our kids to private school, which has already become an established fact. Hawaii has the highest or second highest rate of private schools in the country. And we're just going to keep them down on the plantation, essentially, except now the new plantation is two to three service jobs serving tourism. And um, so that's that part of the equilibrium. That's what you might call dark matter in the sense that those who are, who are floating on top of it don't notice that that's what's holding them up. And, um, and when I talk to the state economists, they all get it, you know. It, it exists and they're all really, now we're really in a moment because we, we painted ourselves into a cul-de-sac. Um, people can't afford to live here anymore. The jobs don't pay enough. We need a workforce, but what if our workforce goes away? And we're, all, we're at the point now where this is starting to really show up. And it showed up in what was called the Great Resignation, um, which was suddenly when work started coming back online and everyone said, Hawaii is open for business in October of 2021. What should happen? But the workers didn't come back to work, or they came back and they found themselves being overworked and they quit. 
So for the first time, and the article goes into this, for the first time, we're having 50,000 people a month quitting, leaving their jobs, even as we're adding 20,000 a month. And the economists were just, they'd never seen anything like this. Well, in the article, I think that you, did you bring up that example of uh, Nikos, which is, oh, yeah. what can you, can you share that again? Because that sure. makes it real. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I highlight four businesses, um, Lex Brody, Michelle Galimba with her uh, grass-fed beef, um, Latour Bakery, which has, puts out like before the pandemic was putting up, I don't know, 100,000 pounds of bread a day, you know, incredible amount of work. All this crashes to a halt. And at Nico's Pier 38, which most of you know the restaurant, they're probably the largest consumer of auction ahi tuna and fish. And they do a, a really good job of just getting it out there. And he employed 150 to 200 people. And, you know, this it was a really, really pinpoint um, operation, really run well. I did a full story on them once and just found it uh, impressive as a business writer. But then everything gets shut down to nothing. <clears throat> then he's selling ahi in the parking lot at, at bargain basement prices in order to keep going. People drive up and they give them auction ahi, right? For four or $5 a pound. Then October 21 comes, he said, or actually summer comes and tourists are returning. They bring back the people that they can. They've had people they've kept on. And he said, they come in and they are overwhelmed by the number of tourists who are coming in. But also everything is faster and more rushed less pleasant and they said the tourists were really unpleasant now this is a case of pent-up demand right but it's also a case where J japanese tourists were the basis of our tourism economy aren't coming <clears throat> they still aren't coming and what we're getting was bargain basement mass market tourists from the united states primarily from the western states were coming in and some of them had a chip on their shoulders and they were really um, getting in the faces of the service workers here. It's not just at Nikos, but around the state. This has been widely reported, but it, it has a real effect on you if you're taking it every day. And uh, so you found people quitting, burning out, quitting, starting a job, their, their old job and saying, you know what, I, I don't want to take it anymore. So was it, was it, that's amazing that, um, that, that behavior, uh, that kind of like compare the rude, rude, rudeness, right. Or the, the not, not respectful, uh, tour, tourists who aren't respectful of our service industry. Um, like, as you say, um, we're used to having the Asian, uh, influence here and, and the Japanese, and they didn't present in quite that way as the Americans do. Oh my. Well that that is interesting. So but now that that is stunning and and that was hard on the workers. What what other factors were driving them to quit? I mean is that is that a factor really for Nikos? I mean what were the local were in other words Nikos clientele is mostly tourists. I I guess I thought they were more local but I guess not. They depend on the tourists they get every you know they're well positioned there on Nimitz Highway too. They get a great business going to the airport. You know, yeah. locals make it make it their last stop. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, they actually they I think people have a fisherman's wharf mentality and they, they see a seafood restaurant. And also don't forget the internet has made everything more accessible for everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah. when we used to visit, even though we, you know, my my wife's family is here and we come up for our visits, we'd forget everything except for just one or two local places and have to relearn it. Um, but more to the point also in a point that Paul Brubaker was making and Eugene Tian. Um, and these are the team, economists that you've been. These are the economists. Mm -hmm. We don't pay our people enough money to have housing. Then the pandemic hits. They already are living in multi-generational homes which means if one person goes to work and gets COVID, the whole house gets COVID. This was happening and people were dying. And we, again, those of us who have better health care and better situations, we don't know what it's like to have someone in our house 
maybe dying um, or a whole house full of COVID. And this was happening and it's still happening uh, with the new variants because and this is the problem of will we get equilibrium? We all know we're in the middle of the BA5 variant. Mm -hmm. What many of us are only beginning to understand or hear from the news is the more times you get COVID, the more times, the more your odds for long COVID go up. So what we've taken is we've put all these people who aren't making enough money anyway, and we're, they live way out on the west side <clears throat> or, you know, central Oahu. They're crammed into a house. Now, with the economy crashing and no more PPP payments, more people are, crash, are, are tightening and filling up these houses. They're getting more crowded. So we've set up a situation that's just going to keep on rolling. We're going to have, it seems, and this is, again, not my opinion, but the health people's opinion, um, they're very worried that we're going to have more waves, more waves, faster waves, because we, we just have set ourselves up for this, particularly in Hawaii. Yeah, um, this is very, very frightening. So what are these people then um, are um, with with the COVID, it's not going away, but uh, with the variants, but it's not killing people as as it was right. before. And now with the lack of uh, of support, the PPI and the the Biden programs that sent so much money and the unemployment that was bumped up. Now it is the is the reduction of all that federal support going to have an impact on the workers and drive them back into these jobs is that is that a direct uh, equation there that that'll make a difference you know uh, the economists <clears throat> that was part of that discussion of the great resignation because by december the money was already going away or had gone and that was the great fascination was that in the fall of uh, the late fall winter rather of 2021 Wow, they're not coming back to work. They're not rushing back. And then they, they said, "Oh, okay, um, maybe they all have savings." And now we're at a point where they definitely don't have savings. And um, instead, what we have, I think, is this is going to be our new reality, our new equilibrium, which is, um, and it's driving restaurant workers. For example, Honolulu Magazine just had a blog on this. They're having to really curtail operations because they can't get staff and they recognize this is the new normal. A lot of them are, you know, that big wide open restaurant with tons of staff hovering over you is a thing of the past. Mm -hmm. Maybe a few, maybe a few steakhouses and, you know, where you're paying for the waiter. Uh, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, that's the new world and we're, we're living in it. We have to start looking for fixes and the fixes that the, uh, Tian and um, Brubaker, Cartney were all saying is, we have to stop just thinking of ourselves. We really have to build our community from within now. We have to provide the housing, the health care, the education upgrades. And we have to really restructure how Hawaii is working before we hollow it out. And Well, this is really important. And, and given that it's an election year, these are factors that people ought to be considering in their selection of a candidate to take oh, yeah. on the, the CEO jobs, the gov and the lieutenant gov. I mean, th this is critical. Um, well, I, I know there's another interesting idea that came out of the article that was, to me, I think, meaningful for our future. When you talked about the polka dotted swans, which is kind of a take on the the black swan effect. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about what that means for Hawaii? Yeah. Um, well, the, the black swan, which everyone pretty much now knows, was the 2008 crash um, caused by collateralized mortgages, which no one had ever heard of, being sold in tranches and underlying debt that collapsed. And no one even knew who owned the house, whose mortgage was handed over to someone in Switzerland or, you know, London. Yeah. That was called a black swan. We didn't see that coming. And it relates to the fact that when the uh, European explorers reached Australia, swans were black, not white. And they <laughs> said, oh, we always thought swans were white. <clears throat> but now we are not in a situation. I mean, the pandemic was a black swan that was much bigger than 2008. 
And we go, how can that happen? It was only you know, 12 years ago. This is like too soon for another black swan. But we also had in this period, we've had rain bombs wiping out Kauai, right? Uh, twice. And then we have, you know, things like that that utterly cut off an island. We have climate change, you know, stopping the roads going on Honolulu or Oahu. You know, you really have to think about if you're going to drive around the island now. Mm -hmm. um, we see that we're no longer facing black swans, it's polka dot swans. And mm -hmm. I think we're going to see really frequent eruptive, interruptive events. I mean, look at the volcanic eruption. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just going to, we, we no longer are in this every 30 years something happened window. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, we do some things that are coming out of the pandemic, like the short, bringing back business to the United States is going to help the mainland, but it isn't going to help us. They're not bringing a factory back here from China. You know, they're bringing it back to the mainland. Well, so, this is the other question is, how is it that Hawaii can get, uh, take part in the recovery for its own best welfare? What, where does mm -hmm. it go for recovery? I mean, if our, um, I mean, we hope that our politicians, well, our, our governors, our leaders will do something about it, but that what, what is going to happen in terms of trade and like you say, factories and changes mm -hmm. in the U.S. economy? Well, you know, um, they're already, you know, all that talk about over tourism seems to have vanished. Um, the newspaper headlines are celebrating more tourists, you know, or acting worried if there was, you know, 50,000 less tourists this month. Um, meanwhile, the house prices are rising. The rents went up 14% so far in 2022, 14%. Um, that's in, unsustainable, as we know. Um, in terms of forming an economy here, you know, I, I look back, my favorite example, economics, sustainability, is the 1934 dock strike, um, which paralyzed the West Coast and the whole Pacific region. For five months, no ship came to Hawaii. Mm. Nobody, nobody suffered. Hawaii produced 85% of its food. The major imports were fuel and lumber from the Pacific Northwest for building. Um, and, you know, stuff that people buy, but non-essential stuff, you know. Hawaii didn't blink during five months of no supplies. So now we import 90% of everything. But most important of all, we import our economy. We import tourists. It's kind of like they're money bags that come here and we fleece them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, well, when the tourists go away, we have nothing left. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you look at the alternatives, remote work is fine. Call centers are fine. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be producing silicon chips uh, because that imp requires importation of goods. Um, the best thing we could do is really, as Larry Ellison is doing on Lanai, turning to intensive agriculture. And it sounds counterproductive and people say, oh, that's for hippies and crunchy granola types. But you look at the alternatives, like I do most of my shopping at the farmer's market in KCC, not, mm -hmm. because, not because it's hip or anything, it's cheaper, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and the produce is really good. Um, well, I'm, I'm also very pleased to hear Larry Ellison is doing something so positive. How is that working out? Because there always seems to be uh, obstacles, impediments for agriculture here in Hawaii, except for pineapple and sugarcane. And of course, we're out of that. So what has he found yeah. out that he can do? Well, insofar as anyone knows what Larry Ellison is really up to. <laughs> well, we do know that he has been talking up and importing stuff to create, and I believe it's a large amount of hydroponics and controlled ag where you have large frames. Um, and I imagine he's going to do it on a gargantuan scale, you know, um, and he will be growing, I assume, uh, microgreens and, you know, vegetables. And the question is, where is he going to, where is he going to sell them? Is he planning to actually supply Hawaii or is, is this going to be you know, the source of restaurant vegetables for billionaires. Mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> we, we don't know what our billionaires are up to. Um, they're not going to save us, that's for sure. Well, um, 
<laughs> well, except that we're all in the boat. And at one point, they have to get their feet wet, too. So perhaps well, there's some hopefulness there. I mean, I like hearing that. That um, Have you written anything about what he's doing? Um, I was just, yeah. And are, are you planning another article to tell us a little bit more about how Hawaii is going ahead based on what you I, said? I, I think uh, I, I have to keep my articles to come under my, my vest, so to speak. Oh. You know, journalism is a poker game, and we're a, a print magazine. Um, but I, I covered Larry Ellison for years. I'm a marine journalist as well. So, um, and when you follow the, the the guys with the super yachts and the big boats, um, the one thing you learn is um, they're always about creating secure and completely controllable environments. And so, he's got Lanai Zuckerman. He's got Hawaii. Hmm. Um, and we don't, and I heard that there's as many as 15 billionaires who bought in Hawaii in the, over the pandemic. Um, that was a board of realtors comment I heard on the radio. So who knows? Mm -hmm. um, we, won't, we won't know what's going on, but what that does do is it's, it's going to squeeze the average person eventually. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in a way, it's a paradigm of where we are headed because the people who are left are, being, are those who serve the billionaires. The people who are left are those who serve the millionaires or the tourists. Mm -hmm. the, middle, the middle class is, mm -hmm. is, is tighter and tighter and tighter. So it leaves the dilemma here for children not coming back or not able to stay here because they can't make the living. And they've already used up their Ohana privileges by this generation on their lot. So it, it is a, a desperate, it could be a desperate situation. Um, and uh, we'll have to look forward to, as I, I guess we've mentioned before, you know, that maybe the government can help some, but I mean, this could make for a difficult situation in Hawaii. Do you think that that accommodation, that um, agreement that we've all been living under, that equilibrium and happiness with all our private schools and all our low wages, are we going to be there for another generation or are people going to? need to have a different way of living here. I think I have 10 seconds to say this is a case for government. Um, hmm. And it is a case for affordable housing and schools. Yeah. And at least if we can provide trust in those basics, there's hope. Well, that I, I like hearing something positive about government. It's hard to hear much that way that it can do good. It has done awfully good well. Yes, uh, you know, with PPP, and we seem to forget all of that really fast. Now that it's not here, we're back in the ditch. But, well, let's see. We'll see what happens with the election, and we'll have to talk about this some more when some new views emerge about where we're going and how that's all going to work. So uh, look forward to maybe coming back and talking some more about that, Don, with maybe some other uh, participants to see what what's looming, because it's very frightening to hear that Hawaii has these kinds of uh, shadows over it for the future. And, and your article wants us to get back to paradise. We want to be paradise again, but we want to be able to afford it. So I really am sorry we're out of time. And uh, it's uh, um, a thank you to Don Wallace for participating and sharing his views on these issues of Hawaii's economy and the welfare of the state. And uh, we, I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton, and this pro, this show, the State of the State of Hawaii, will be back in two weeks. Thank you so much for your viewership, and mahalo, and uh, aloha to everybody. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter.
and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.